I'm really excited about today's show because I had an incident with my son in the car this morning, taking him to um, camp and he dropped an AirPod that he had uh, in the car. It's, it's in the car. It's somewhere in the car. But when I got back to the car, cause I was taking his sister into a friend of hers, he's like out of the car, frantic, like on the verge of tears. And I'm like, what's the problem? What's going on? I dropped, I dropped my, I dropped my AirPod. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, you dropped it where? It's, it's, it's in the car. It's under the seat. I'm like, okay, all right. We'll give it a quick look. I go looking for it. I can't find it. I really don't have the time. So I'm not putting my full effort into it. My shoulder's messed up. So I don't even have full reach right now. We're in the car and I'm like, why do you look like you're on the verge of just a complete collapse? It's my AirPod, it's my mom, it's my, I, I said, I, I get it. I get it's your AirPod, dude. It's not like I drove over it with the car. You didn't lose it in a river. It's not in a field. It's physically in the vehicle. Yes, you just don't understand. You, it, it, it's, we're going through, and I'm getting so frustrated. So this is that long story around how our family can trigger us without trying, without even trying. I yeah, because in that moment, you're like, you're right. I don't understand. <laughs> I love you. And then I'm listening to myself get loud. I'm like yelling at him at one point, like, stop it. It's in the car. Why are you freaking out? Why am I freaking out? <laughs> what is the reality that's going on here? So we finally, both of us got calm. I actually apologized to my son. I said, I apologize for getting way too emotional about this because the, at the end of the day, what you're looking for is in this car. We just have to find it. And I really shouldn't have gone all the way. I said, but son, sometimes you just can find that way to get me going. <laughs> and he still couldn't. He finally got himself calm. I got him off to camp. He let it go. And but I know when I pick him up, the first thing he's going to say is, did you find my AirPod? I love this, Rish, because on today's show, you and our listeners, but you are going to get real time, real life coaching from a woman who I know very well personally. She is determined to empower other women to create that inner strength when you need it most. <laughs> Like when you're trying to find AirPods and, and in fact, when you don't even really care, you're just trying to like calm the situation. But right, but how many, how many storms like that do we have every day, big or small moments throughout the day that trigger us in life as parents at work and, and how our thoughts really shape our reality. I mean, in that moment for your son, his reality was that device that he just loves and needs in his life was gone and gone forever and it's never ever and his thoughts were just creating this panic in him that created a panic in you of trying to just calm him down yeah <laughs> but how yeah. can you calm someone down when you're panicking yourself because you're panicking about the fact that he's panicking <laughs> it's just a vicious circle it's just, you know, it's just a vicious circle. Confidence, however, wins that race. So we'll see what's going to happen with this. It's so much easier said than done. <laughs> but let's do this. Let's get our guest on the show today. The Think Tank of Three starts now. just a second ago, confidence wins the race. Uh, but it's so much easier said than done, right? On today's show, real-time coaching from a woman determined to empower and to create uh, that inner strength for others. Oh, this is exciting. We are so glad you are with us. Welcome to the Think Tank of Three podcast. I am Julie Holton here with my co-host, Rishia Candidate Capasaurus. Our third today is a life coach. She is a woman whose passion is to help other women design a life 
that feels as successful on the inside as it looks on the outside? How often do you feel like people are looking at you like you're so successful, you have all these things, but inside you're like, I don't have shit or, or, or I don't have the things I want. I'm a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so her focus is really taking what that appearance is on the outside and helping us to feel that on the inside. Melanie McNamara coaches through an intersectional and feminist theory lens. Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Julie and Rishia. And oh my gosh, that that example you just provided is a beautiful thing we're going to get to dissect today. Like that was a perfect story. I was just laughing and nodding and also going, yep, I see it. Let's show you where it's coming from. <laughs> so good. I, I tell you uh, on this show, <laughs> you know, we love dissecting perfect word, uh, the many facets of identity, things that make us gender, race, class, sexual orientation, disabilities, everything that influences our individual experiences in life, we get into that stuff. And in fact, my son, you know, um, is uh, on the spectrum, on the ASC spectrum, he's high functioning, mm -hmm. but I also have to remind myself and my, my husband and I have to remind one another, his mind works a little bit different. You got to remember that you got, and I have to keep playing that over and over because my daughter is, is typical. My, my, my younger one, she's typical. So there is a difference in how we uh, interact with both of these individuals. And I need mm -hmm. to remember, it's like, okay, there's, there's something else going on within his <laughs> reality of my world is over because the AirPod I dropped didn't drop out of the car and a river. It's in the car, yeah. <laughs> but I got to bring him into that reality. Um, how did these things tie into your coaching specifically? What is intersectional and feminist theory lens, what you, that is something that's within what you do. What does that mm -hmm. mean? Yeah. For, so for me, it's, it's intersectional is taking into account. First of all, I know nothing about anyone else's experience, right? Um, the way they were raised, wh whether, you know, their gender, their um, ethnicity, their race, their you know, family of origin, whatever that is, like, we're all so different and varied. And then all these things converge, like um, any kind of neurodiversity or disability, um, whether it's visual or, or non visual you know, like, we can see it, or we can't see it. Um, how all those things come together is what makes us all so very unique. And then the feminist theory part of it is just recognizing the role, the traditional roles of um, male, female, men, women that we've seen that have been around for millennia and, and like how it, it's ever evolved and everything. But um, the messages we receive growing up, again, from society, our culture, and our family, depending on what our mm. um, you know gender is at birth, assigned gender at birth. So and Melanie, what I what I love about your feminist approach is that it's very similar to how Risha and I approach it on this show, because I think many times we're very reluctant to even call ourselves feminists or to label the podcast in any kind of way. We are just here as women who experience life as women and we're sharing with other women and we have men in our in our audience and nothing about our topics or our focus is meant to bash men in any way. And Melanie, one of the things that I really appreciate about you is you talk about how the patriarchy also impacts men and it impacts how, you know, everything from how they're raised to how they interact in society. It impacts all of us. And oftentimes it's the awareness and education that brings about the changes that we want to see. And I think it's so important to, to put a voice to it because oftentimes we'll look at, we'll look at this and it, it almost seems like we're blaming men for the way that society is. And we're not, they're just as much victim to, you know, what, you know, the, the kind of, um, the systems that are placed on them as well. Can you talk about that? Yes. And I'm so glad that you mentioned it because just a side story real quick. We were at like an event in our neighborhood, like a barbecue, you know, get to know your neighbor kind of thing. I was chatting with this, with this guy and 
I said, he asked what I did. I said, oh, I'm a feminist life coach for women. And he said, oh, and I could just feel he immediately tensed up. He goes, oh, are you one of those feminists who bash on men and hate men? And I'm like, not in the least. I love men. I love all the men, right? I've got a dad. I've got a husband. I've got two sons, all the, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter, but it's about how it does like recognizing the water we're swimming in you know, the air we're breathing, like we don't notice the air until we actually become aware of it and how it does hurt men. So like, so for example, just one, one, one or two ways is men are, are pretty much programmed from the beginning that you are the caretakers and you take care of your family. Right. And so, um, one of my friends tells a story of how, when her husband lost his job through no fault of his own downsides, it crushed him. He felt like I'm no longer a man. I can't provide for him. They were perfectly fine, but he, he was so crushed by that. And, you know, or like, you know, boys shouldn't cry or show emotion. You should be strong. I guess anger is an okay emotion for men, but, <laughs> but you're not allowed to cry and you're, you know, and it's like, we have emotions are a huge part of what I do. Although I do thought work, it's the, it's the, um, intersection <laughs> of thought work with the emotional work. And when men aren't al allowed quote unquote <laughs> to feel their feelings, it creates not some, not good scenarios for them right. and the other people around them. Unhealthy. Um, I, unhealthy. it's, it's, it is interesting how you just do kind of fall into those roles. And Julie, you and I, we've, we've discussed this and we discussed this earlier in, in other podcasts about, I, I, I kind of have that understanding of, I, I hate to sound like, yeah, I, you know, I get men, but there is a part of that male brain that I totally get because I experienced it with myself when you think to yourself, when you're confident and you're, you're locked into what you're doing. And, you know, I had my whole television career and my life was in check. I had my list going, everything was going the way it was supposed to be going. And remember, Julie, I was saying like, and I remember even when I was trying, you know, thinking about my, my future with my husband or who that person was going to be, I wasn't looking for someone who was going to support me. I just needed them to be an equal partner with me. So I, this was my mindset. I, I think my mom, helped me really with with the independent side of thing but the problem was I on my own went so far into like the career side of everything that when my career went away and not by by choice I did not know what to do all of a sudden I really didn't have um a definition of self anymore and it took me a really really long time to get out of that because it was, I, 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 without even realizing it, I was defining myself by my career, by my ability to take care of myself and not need anybody and, to help that. And, and Rish, I think too, it's so important to play out, like, as we like dissect you for a moment, like you also, so look at this, because I think, I think this is really relatable for a lot of women, but also it's important to point out you were, you were thriving in a man's world. I mean, mm -hmm. let's, let's be real. The, the broadcasting world is very male driven. You, and you weren't just in broadcasting as I was, I was in news. You, you were the anchor at ESPN, you were in sports. So, and you're an athlete, you, your whole life has been very, um, like you've been surrounded by men. And so you fit right in with your confidence, with your ability to stand on your own and, and to stand up for yourself, to have a successful career. And then you transitioned from that to a son and a daughter. So suddenly you're in this nurturing motherly role, which you're very good at, and also is very different from that independent world that you had been living in. So now you're a wife, you're a mother, you have a son who has special needs and your world. I mean, I don't know that you can get much different from one world to the right. other with such a drastic transition. Right. Right. And, and maybe that, maybe that's, why certain things like will, 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 for lack of better term, trigger, right? Because you don't realize, you, you don't even realize what's underlying, which is how Melanie can get into that. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that came up when you were talking is, you know, separating out role from identity, right? Like you mm -hmm. had identified with your role and whether it's the type of role that you were in or a stay-at-home mom. 
when mm-hmm. a stay at home mom, she identifies herself so uh, strongly with being that. And then the kids go off to college and whatnot, or leave, leave the house. Suddenly now she's what? left. Yeah. Now what? And she's left feeling empty and like, wh- who am I? Mm-hmm. And so I, that's where so many of us get to that point. And again, it goes to like, what is your background? It, it Sometimes it, it doesn't matter. We still have the same patterns of thought oftentimes. That's and we awesome. don't have to go through this alone. I think mm-hmm. that's what, what the, if there's one thing that people take away from this podcast episode, it's that we don't have to navigate this journey alone. In mm-hmm. fact, Melanie and I are working together. We started working together a few months ago because of this very reason. Not that I, I'm not, I'm not changing careers. I'm not, I haven't, I don't feel like I've lost my identity, but I look ahead at the transitions I want to make. And preemptively, I'm already thinking, well, wait a minute. I don't want to lose sight of what I want as a person. You know, in the last year and a half, I, I have a partner, I have a stepson with special needs, I have a second business that recently launched, I have all of these really amazing and wonderful things happening. And at the end of every day, I'm exhausted just trying to figure out where do I focus my time? Do I have any time for me? What does that even look like? And, and sometimes I, I hate to even voice it because it it's a, a very privileged life that I live although I've come to hate the word privilege, but we'll save that for another podcast. But <laughs> I, I recognize the I recognize what I have. And every day I'm grateful and giving thanks for what I have. I also recognize that this is effing hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like this is not easy. And none of it is for anyone, whether right. we're on our way up or we're falling to the bottom, like wherever we are in this journey, it is hard. And there are days with our son um, and Rish and I have a lot of conversations about this where I just feel like, oh my gosh, I am failing in every possible way. <laughs> and, and I know that's not true, but it's like, we just need that person sometimes or people, that community, that tribe to grab a hold of. And Melanie has been that for me in the last couple of months as I figure out on the business side, what does balance look like? How do I determine what what's right for me, not just what's right for me as a mom, as a partner, as a business owner, but me as an individual, because I can see, and, and I would reach, I was, I totally relate to you when I, when I was in the process of leaving news, I had, there was a time in my career where I was at a really, really toxic station, TV station, and there were, um, layoffs coming. I was able to leave prior to that. I can't say much because I, you know, signed an NDA, but let's just say I found myself, um, with severance and out of a contract and figuring out, I had a few months to figure out what am I going to do? Am I going to stay in news? I'd already been in news for 12 years. I was feeling the burnout. I wanted to leave. I didn't know what I could possibly do. My identity was an executive TV news producer, an Emmy award winner. And I did not know who I was without that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and it's a process. And I actually, at one of the stations, I finally figured out at that time that the best thing for me was was to find another job in news because that's what I knew. And I could use uh, a healthy station to help me transition out and figure out what was going to come next. But during that process, I interviewed at a station and the general manager was almost like a grandfatherly type person who like, we ended up just having this very personal conversation about detoxing and what that was going to look like coming out of that toxic newsroom and figuring out who I was and who I was without all of that toxic environment around me. Um, And I don't even know why I just went off on that tangent, but it's just, you know, there are so many transitions that we make in life and making sure that we know who we are. And Melanie, I know that's a really big, big part about your coaching, that it really comes back to, you often will repeat to me things that I have said in prior conversations to pull back out of me. Um, you know, what it is that you see in me. So tell us about this journey. What is it about coaching women? What is it that has inspired you to even take this path? Yeah. So there was something I wanted to say before I even told you that about um, trusting ourselves. So let's say, let's talk about for a second, you know, women 
if you think about it, we are taught from a very young age, we can't trust our own judgment. Mm -hmm. And for example, looking at all the magazines, we have, we have to be taught how to dress, how to look, how to act, how to get a man, how to keep a man, you know, all these things. And so it makes a lot of sense that if we identify with our role and then that role is no longer there, we're floundering. And then we can, we start looking outside of ourselves for the answers. So when I take you back to something you have said, it's to bring you back to your own inner wisdom, right? Because we have that, we have that inner wisdom, but we've been, it's been socialized out of us or, you know, whatever reason for whatever reason, we forget that we can tap into that and we really do have the answer. So as a coach, that's what I help women find. I help them peel off all the layers of, do we swear on this podcast? <laughs> Julie off. already has a couple I of mean, times. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> you just peel off all the layers of bullshit. And then it's like, oh, there it is. There it is. And trusting that, that gut feeling you get, if it, hold you back. It's like, okay, let's question, is this fear or just nor like normal fear? Or is this going against everything that my inner wisdom is telling me? So dissecting all of that. So I just wanted to put that in there for a little nugget for everyone. But what started me, um, is, oh my gosh, the limiting, I'll call them limiting beliefs. Cause I bet your audience has definitely heard that term before <laughs> the limiting beliefs I had placed on myself my whole life. Um, from the outside, I seemed very successful. I had a, you know, a really great career. Um, I, you know, my marriage looked like, oh, we were this powerhouse kind of couple in our, in our industry. I was in real estate and, um, I felt like I was just slugging through life. I felt trapped. I, I was in looking back now, I understand I was deep in burnout, I was unhappy and I'd sit in my car and cry before I walked in the house and I'd sit in my car and cry before I walked in the office and I just, it felt terrible. And I like to call it inspirational porn. You know, all those like fancy memes you see like the, it's like inspirational porn. And I'm like, yes. And I've got those plastered everywhere and my whole Pinterest page filled with the inspirational porn. And I'm like, I don't know how to feel it though. I can't get it. So that, you know, there was this disconnect. And, um, I was drinking way more than I wanted to. I was definitely emotionally eating looking back. I understand that now what I was doing. Um, and it just, it all came to a head when I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. This was back in 2016. And, um, it, of course, along with the fear, there was this like peace and clarity and relief that washed over me for many reasons, one being, oh my God, I can just take a step out of that life that was burning me out so badly and focus on this thing that I understood. I have no control over it. However, I have control on how I show up and, you know, cancer could take my life from me, but it cannot take my experience of me living my life away from me. So it, it was, it was this crazy juxtaposition or whatever in my brain of like, how can I feel so calm going through these cancer treatments and all the stuff that all the things that came along with it. Um, when my regular life that looks so good from the outside felt so terrible. So then, um, went through all the treatments and, you know, no evidence of disease went on with, you know, back to normal. Oh, yay. You know, the cancer confetti gets swept away and suddenly I'm back in that life that I didn't want to live anymore. So I found, I went through a little bit, just a very little bit of therapy and I'm like, okay, that felt good, but I, I know I need more. And that's when I found this whole world of life coaching that I knew not about <laughs> and, um, took deep dive into, I found a podcast. I took a deep dive into that and just started consuming everything I could about life coaching and the, how it really clicked. I had certainly heard before that, you know, you get programmed with belief systems and then you have thoughts and they create your feelings, which then drive your actions and create your results. And I'd heard all that before, but suddenly it clicked how to separate the facts from my beliefs and my story. I call it your story about the facts. And when I, when that clicked into place, it just, 
everything just accelerated in, in my learning and my understanding of why I felt the way I felt. And then I was able to um, start living a much more fulfilled life. You're talking about shaping your reality. Yep. <laughs> You're talking about taking the reality that's there, not denying it, not ignoring it, but actually uh, configuring it or reconfiguring it in a way that it's 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 not the negative that it that it feels like. It's taking those those other pieces. So, how do you help your clients? achieve that because it you obviously had to go through some steps mm -hmm. to get there but you you literally just mm -hmm. pointed out, basically you had to change mm -hmm. you know and and without people without saying okay we're not talking about alternative facts and alternative realities folks we're yeah. talking about the reality for which you live but yes. finding those pieces and readjusting your I guess lens right yes oh that's a beautiful way to put it and, and we're not talking toxic positivity either. Cause that's what I thought well, mindset thing. was. Yeah. That's a real I, thing. <laughs> yeah. I thought mindset meant you have to beat yourself up and make yourself, you know, push yourself through all these terrible things. And, um, there's a silver lining and you have to just be positive, be happy all the time. I think that's the worst thing we can tell that we've learned or that society tells us, or we tell ourselves is the pursuit of happiness is the ultimate goal. And it's not, it's not the ultimate goal. So, um, so, okay. So this is a beautiful way that I can sort of describe it and take you through it. So this whole situation with your son this morning. Mm. <laughs> so the reality was he started and like, sometimes I break it down to like kind of the ridiculous, like he was saying words, right. maybe with his speech kind of fast. Did he have tears? Maybe he had tears coming out of his eyes. They or... were they were starting to well. The, the, yeah. I could see and the the face. It was all it was all leading to. I'm going to drop some massive tears, and we yeah. got him to stop. But he was on his way. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So the fact that most of us in the world, most rational people in the world, could look at and say these are the facts. What did you make that mean about? what did you make it mean that he, what he was saying and that he was about to cry and his emotions, what, what did you make that mean? So I said to him, I can see, I need you to stop and think for a moment. I said, and then I just asked him questions. Cause I was thinking maybe if he hears the questions, this might help. I said, I can see, is the AirPod outside of the car? No. Did I drive over it? Bust it? No. Did you lose it in the river yesterday when you went to your, you know, you know, hiking or uh, bike riding time at camp? No. Is it off in some field somewhere? No. Where is it? It's physically in the car. Yes. Yes. So let's stay there. And then, and then, but even after acknowledging that he's like, you just don't care. They're expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then that's what then set me off. Because I'm like, we just established that it's not gone forever and it's not lost. We just established that it's physically in the car and you're not breathing that in and saying, okay, big picture. So okay. then I went down so, my road of bad mommying. <laughs> well, you had mentioned earlier, you were like, he's freaking out. Yeah. Like, he, he was freaking he's out. Too emotional. And then how do you feel when you're looking at your son, he's freaking out, he's being really emotional, you're thinking all that. How does that feel with you? Like, what's the feeling? For me in that moment, I, it was frustrating because I, I understood that there's no need to be this emotional about this. I okay. understood that your AirPod is under the car seat in the car so that I could. So for me, I was being very selfish in my thought process instead of saying, son, listen, I hear you. That's what I didn't do this morning. Yeah. I hear that you're upset. I hear that this really bothers you. I hear that you're really scared about your AirPod that yeah. I did not do this morning. Yeah. This morning I was like, I need to get you over to camp. We've already wasted extra time. <laughs> so I, that's, you know, so like I said, then I fell into my bad mommying because instead of stopping and acknowledging, cause I know that that's important for him to acknowledge the words that are coming out of his mouth, to make sure he feels like he's being heard. Yeah. And so 
I didn't do that. Yes. Julie, I know Julie saw me writing. <laughs> I'm writing because here's what I want to show I you. This... Coming, Cause I've been there. Reesh. I <laughs> have so been there. All yes. <laughs> yeah. Because your, your actual thought is there's no need to be this emotional. So right. you're like looking at him and he's doing all these things. And you're like, there's no need to be this emotional is your thought, which creates the frustration, the frustrated right. feeling. So from frustration, you try to logic his way out of emotions, which <laughs> will never work. And failing that you start yelling at him. So the result is you're the one creating extra emotions <laughs> that that were unnecessary, right? I can step in here. I'm not Melanie, but I will say, <laughs> and now your thoughts are judging yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> that's ding, ding, well, ding, now ding. you're like even <laughs> saying like, oh, and then I started bad mommying. Like we do that, especially as women, we're now all of a sudden, as we're working through whatever that situation was to determine, you know, how are we going to react next time? What's going to create a better outcome? Now we're judging ourselves mm -hmm. and our judgments are not nice. I can tell you that. <laughs> how many times, Melanie, do you say to me like, oh, and how does it feel when your thoughts tell you that you're awful? <laughs> I can did say, I think I said it earlier, but I can say that I proudly will pat myself on the back because before we got to the destination, I did apologize to him. Yes. I did say, honey, I got way too emotional and I shouldn't have done that because it, it it's, but again, I still tried to logic it out because what did I say? I shouldn't have done that because it's just not, we just didn't need to go down that road. Yeah. <laughs> so even, even in my apology, <laughs> right. Even in your apologies, you're like, we sh I shouldn't have gotten that emotional when he's going to hear, I shouldn't be, you know, emotions are bad <laughs> and which perpetuates high levels of emotion. So like, like you, you were like, yes, Julie was spot on. First, we need to remove all the judgment that we did it wrong. And my favorite way to do that. And I learned from a coach, this very phrase is just to say how human of me, like that's how human of me. Okay. I'm not a bad mommy. That was I'm immediately not... calming. <laughs> right. I was like, <laughs> seriously, like I literally felt my shoulders go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so human, like, oh, of course. Well, here's, so then you go to, you know, and like, there's no need to be this emotional. You're very judgmental of him in that moment. Um, you know, and, uh, so oh, I can think some of the other things we talked about, right? So that this is what we're talking about is we create our reality through our thoughts, our thoughts shape our reality. If you were like, well, of course he's feeling emotional in his world, you know, so and it's not about judging ourselves after it's like, oh, next time I feel that frustration coming, I know where it's coming from, or I can ask myself some questions and figure out why am I feeling so frustrated? Taking the pause, right? Taking a pause and saying, okay, I, I'm in a hurry. I'm the one in a hurry. <laughs> what in, in like some other questions are like, what am I making this mean? about him or about me or about the situation. And you made it mean, you know, you're going to be late. There's no need to be this emotional. Let's just be logical about this. My son, how old is he? He's 12. He's 12. <laughs> and he's got some, you know, stuff some going on. <laughs> yeah. He's got some stuff going on with all the love. And so like, of course, yes, he's going to be emotional. So if you were like, oh yeah, of course it's there, there's clouds and it's raining. Of course it's raining. You can be like, oh, he's got some thoughts. Of course he's going to feel emotional and allow him to just have his time to be emotional. That's when we learn how to pro you can, then we can talk, teach him how to process those emotions right. in a healthy way. Um, but we're like trying to stifle and push the emotions away and resist them. Who knew today's show was going to be a therapy session for me? <laughs> Doesn't it feel so good? <laughs> well, what okay, do I say, Jules? Know. What do I say? Everybody needs. Yeah. Everybody well, needs therapy. I want to, I want to take this example and broaden it out a little bit. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some common thought patterns that tend to hold women back? 
you know, this, this situation is very specific to, you know, to reach this morning with her son, but there are so many patterns that we find ourselves get, you know, falling into, you know, for instance, like reach with her son might tend to come back to trying to logic the, the emotion out or, or reason with him, but there are other thought patterns, you know, yes. one, one type of, um, of situation that we talk about on the show often comes up when we're talking with our guests who, who tend to be, you know, women who are very successful, but don't necessarily see themselves that way. I mean, every mm-hmm. person we ask, you know, when did you know you've made it? They're like, well, I still haven't made it right. Like part of that internal versus external, you know, mm-hmm. uh, viewpoint. But one, one topic that comes up a lot is imposter syndrome mm-hmm. and which I know we can do a whole episode with you on <laughs> imposter syndrome, but yes. what are some of these thought patterns that you recognize that women, like one woman after another experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I mean, so much of not enoughness. I'm not enough. I don't know enough. I haven't done enough. Um, Anytime you hear that, um, uh, I I think of them like, okay, so I think I told you this before, Julie, like chow, C-H-O-W. So I think of it as chow, like, let's get rid of the chow. And it's like, coulda, coulda. Um, I could have done that. Um, H is like half to need to a is like um ought to um wait oh oh (laughs) oh is ought to w is like woulda coulda and shoulda for you know so like any when any of those thought patterns come up but it's usually some form of not enough and i'll use myself as an example i'm gonna put myself out there and tell you a deep seated belief that i have that I have uncovered that will show up in many ways. And I'll share with you is I'm not smart enough. And I got that from growing up. I was the youngest. So I was like, kind of just my, my sister and I, she was really smart. And I was like, well, I'm just, I'm not as smart as her. And no one ever said that explicitly. Um, but I, I inherited this belief. I'm not smart enough, which then went on to like, I, I, well, I did go to college. I didn't graduate college. And and in my career, it's like, well, I'm not smart enough to do this thing. Even I didn't know it in the forefront. It was running. I always think of it like on the TV, you know, the broadcast at the bottom, the ticker tape at the bottom. It's like, I'm not smart enough is just, and sometimes it'll pop up in different ways. So holding me back, would be things like, um, I, I need all the certifications before I do anything. I have to take another class. I can't help anyone until I take this class or do this thing or learn this other thing, or I'm constantly in like learning mode instead of go out there and do something. Um, I'm not smart enough would be like, I was, I was a very good real estate agent with very good instincts and very good knowledge of every, all things real estate, but I would question myself constantly and go, I I would walk down the hall at the brokerage and talk to like three different brokers and say, what would you put? Is this, you know, what would you put in the, and I was always like, yeah, that's what I would do too. (laughs) But I never trusted myself. Even though you already had those answers, you wanted backup to your answers. Yep. Validation, confirmation. We, and I, a coach said this once and it sticks in my head. We use other people as validation vending machines. Mm. We're like putting nickels in and being like, validate me. Let me know that. And, and not in a, I don't want to, you know, put, it's not like, oh, we're so terrible to ourselves. We are, <laughs> but it's like, oh, let's be aware of it. When we are seeking validation outside of ourselves, it's great. Feedback is great, but but knowing, yeah, I do have the answers. Um, so that uh, that's just my own. And it still pops up, not smart enough. Um, and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, I'm not doing that thing because I'm, that's that thought again. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not a problem. I don't have to get rid of it. I just have to be aware that that one's going to pop up a lot. Let's- I'm not smart enough to do this podcast. Oh, so- <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Are any of us? <laughs> I mean, if that's gonna if we're gonna go down that road, hey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. I am going to pull from Saturday Night Night Live. We are smart enough. We are strong enough. And damn it, people like us. That's right. (laughs) It's so true. And Um, oh, may I, may I build on that just for a minute? Um, You know, positive affirmations, right? Um, There is a place for those. 
a hundred percent, but you right. have to have some belief, right? You have to have an inkling of belief. And I, I teach a concept like a thought ladder. I think you can Google it, but it's like, let's start leveling up our thoughts from I'm not smart enough to like, I'm smart enough to do anything, right? There's a gap. And I can't just sit and look in the mirror and say, you are smart enough to do anything because I will not believe it. And my brain will constantly be arguing with me. I'll be looking in the mirror going, you are smart enough to do anything. No, you're not. You are smart enough to do anything. No, you suck. <laughs> you know, like right. there will be a constant. So I need to one level up like, well, I'm smart in some areas. Like that mm -hmm. might be a, a thought that's like 1% less shitty, feels mm -hmm. a little bit less shitty. And then that becomes my norm. Right. And then the next one. And so, yeah, just to build on that. So that's why positive affirmations don't, they don't work unless you, you believe have to it. believe them. And some... I have, I have with my daughter specifically, and I I've actually tried to do more with my son as well. Um, she says every day, you know, before she, you know, we're in the summer, well, yeah, we're in summertime, but, but for school would we'll tell her every morning before she walk in the building, you're smart, you're strong you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And to the point where it got to the point where I would, she would run and give me a hug. And then she would just look at me and she'd say, smart, strong, I can do anything. And then she'd run yeah. into the building and I didn't yeah. have to, you are her anymore. So yeah. maybe that's part of it is starting off when they're, when they're younger, L let's get into the science, the science backed brain theory within mm -hmm. your coaching. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. What's, what's that look like in practice? We've got a, like a primal brain. And it's hardwired. It's called the motivational triad to seek pleasure, expend minimal energy and, uh, you know, be super efficient and avoid pain at all costs. And of course, way back when, uh, you know, when brains were being developed and hardwired, we had to avoid the pain of freezing to death or wild animals or the toxic berries out in the forest. And now it's like, avoiding pain is like avoiding going on a podcast and sharing my thoughts with the world. The whole world is listening and, or, <laughs> or like going on stage or applying for a job or just going to a networking event and meeting someone and talking to them. That's, that's the pain, um, seeking pleasure. So, um, there's true pleasure, which gives us the like dopamine, like true pleasures in our life, like walking in nature and connection with people and all of, you know, whatever brings you pleasure. And then there's false pleasures that are so readily available, like concentrated food, like sugar and, and pizza and all the, and nothing wrong with those, but that's false pleasure. It gives us like that short-term dopamine hit with a net negative result, right. In our lives. Some, sometimes, um, over drinking, right. The alcohol, the scrolling social media, you know, all the things, um, those are the false pleasures. And then being efficient is like, yeah, of course, Tuesday at two o'clock, I do not want to sit down and write out my marketing plan because <laughs> that takes a lot of brain power. I would much rather lay on the couch and watch Netflix. Right. So, just noticing those are, we're already hardwired with that. So that's the brain, you know, part of the brain science part of it that I think of. And Melanie, um, I know you have some great videos that really walk through not just this process, um, mm -hmm. which I think is is the first step in, in understanding and having that awareness, like you said, but mm -hmm. then also what to do about it. You know, so if we yeah. feel like our wiring is a little bit janky, mm -hmm. you know, how to start correcting those thought patterns and, and really going through the process. You have some great videos on, on Facebook, Melanie McNamara. I wish we could get into more today because I don't know how the time has flown by. I would love to talk. I mean, we need to do like a whole series with you. We're um, bringing Melanie back, period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes. Well, because there's so more much more Melanie on her Facebook page, <laughs> Melanie McNamara Coaching. We'll link to it down below. Melanie, before we go, you're not off the hook quite yet. We do three rapid fire questions with every okay. single guest on our show. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, first question, what is one piece of advice that you would give specifically to aspiring women leaders? Well, that piece we talked about earlier, I'm not good at, you know, I'm not smart enough. Yes, you are. Um, learn 
I would say learn how to um, advocate for yourself and take chances. Um, it brings up to mind this, this, um, these studies that show that men will apply for a job if they match like a very low percentage of criteria and women will only apply for a job if they meet like 90 to 100% of the criteria, whether it's applying for a job or advocating for a raise. And if you're an entrepreneur, that could be advocating raising your prices, sharing your prices with your clients without feeling, I mean, you doing it even while feeling the fear <laughs> so there's a lot of money stuff but yeah that would that's what i would say is is you know find a good mentor to help you through that or a coach <laughs> we discussed that so much about the different the dynamic between yeah. women and like exactly what you said a yeah. guy can one out of ten they've got one out of ten oh i can do this we're like yeah. we've got nine out of ten we're like oh i don't know I don't have that 10th thing. Our um, podcast episode with Jamel <laughs> Phil is so yes. good. So on hilarious that. when yeah. she talks about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll um, go back and listen to that. Can you please share either a thought, a quote, a book, or resource, something that, that had a significant impact on your journey? Well, initially, the way I found life coaching and what changed my entire life was um, I found a podcast called the Life Coach School Podcast with Brooke Castillo. And, um, I, you know, that was five or six years ago. And I've evolved a bit from like now I'm like, oh, you know, changed a few of my opinions. But that podcast absolutely introduced me to like modeling out my thoughts and what thought work was and then which led me to the emotional work of it and all of that but uh that was significant for me and then amazing authors like Brene Brown and Byron Katie um Byron Katie's The Work um that's a that's an amazing one Melanie, you coach a lot of women, but what if you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice? What would it be? You are smart enough and you are good enough. And I would advise her that um, to create financial freedom for herself because my socialization, and I don't even know what where it was, but I had this belief that the man was gonna take care of me. And not to say my husband doesn't, but I like, like I having that independence. I think Julie, you and I spoke about that one time about having that financial independence, how important that was to you. And I never got that memo. <laughs> and I would have loved to have had gotten that memo um, and created more wealth for myself where I could just feel much the more freedom. See, so that's why we have this podcast because we need a little piece of you and a little piece of yeah. me and a little piece of Breach <laughs> and all the women listening to create, you know, this collective whole. Melanie, I have a bonus question actually. <laughs> Breach, I'm going off script because you also say something really beautiful about your future self. Could you share with us your thoughts on how your future self gives you guidance? Yeah. So I, I always thought that was kind of silly. I'm like, I didn't know how to create my future self. And I thought there was like some dynamics some steps to do it, but it's just envisioning who do I want to be or where do I want to be? What's around me? So I'm in, so I create this future version of myself. Who's not perfect. Like we don't, we're not striving for perfection, but I look to her for answers. She's my own best mentor. So if I'm making a decision, I look to my future self and say, what would she choose? Mm. You know, the one who's already done it, the one who already knows the how, who, the one who's, who's like, it's okay, girl, just come on. Like, she's like, come on, girl, I got you. I'm waiting for you. It's okay. I'm not in a hurry, but you're coming. Ugh. And she just reminds me every day that oh, I'm coming. I'll get there and to enjoy the journey along the way. That's awesome. That is so awesome. Uh, we so many topics in today's show and so many episodes <laughs> in this one. <laughs> yeah. We are definitely going to have you back. That is an absolute must. We have to have you back. But that is all for this episode of Think Tank of Three. Please show your support by hitting the subscribe button and the best way, that is the best way to help us spread the love. Thank you so much for tuning in.